Hi, I'm Rosie, Head of MPD at Atom Brands, and today I'm going to be talking to you all about bottling and closures. So as a producer, you spend your days pouring your passion into what you do, incredible liquids that you're proud to share with the world. But what happens when all of that hard work is put at risk because the packaging just isn't fit for purpose? So the consumer experience can potentially be affected massively if they can't get into the bottle or if it's damaged. The enjoyment of your product can be tainted, the physical enjoyment, but also their memory of your product as well. So there are a multitude of things to consider from which markets you're shipping to, how the product's being used, and of course, more recently, sustainability. So corks are a really important part of any spirit and it doesn't have to be a cork, it could be a screw cap, it can be any sort of closure and when I talk about closure I'm talking about the bit that actually stops the um, liquid coming into contact with the air, so it can be a cork or a screw cap or whatever. Um, so natural cork, I mean there's something really really romantic and unmistakable about a natural cork, right? that sound. It's something that we all know and love. Um, and it's it's romantic, it's evocative, it makes you feel. And I personally associate it really closely with, with Scotch whiskey. Um, but as we know, cork tone and TCA is a thing. Although it's less common in spirits, nobody wants their spirit to taste of cork. And even in um, white spirits and gin and vodka, um, you might not be able to taste it, but you can see it. And nobody wants their product to be sort of discolored and um, because from an aesthetic standpoint it can be really unpleasant um you have synthetic corks which have the benefit of being completely man-made you don't get cork taint but they're not as romantic they're definitely cheaper to produce and you can guarantee that your spirit will stay unaffected from a color and taste point of view and completely intact however be mindful of using a synthetic cork because of their makeup they're harder than natural corks, which means that when you push it into a bottle, it's got less give. Um, so it's really important to do a really, really good testing with these, making sure you're finding the right cork for the right product. Um, because if it doesn't go in enough, then obviously it pops um, and it could potentially not seal the bottle properly. And obviously, if it's too small, you get uh, interaction with the air and the cork and everything, and that increases the chance of a, it being damaged or you getting cork taint. Um, so there's a trade off versus natural and synthetic. Um, but then also you've got micro agglomerate. So these are constructed from uniform sized microgranules and they have the same look and feel as natural cork, um, but they're much more cost effective. Now, the only downside from my point of view on these is the fact that because they're not made out of cork, um, they have to be sort of glued together. Um, cork's completely biodegradable, it's sort of um, quite e quite sustainable, economically it's an option and it's great. Um, with micro agglomerate, it's glued together. So already you're introducing something which isn't sustainable um, to a sustainable product. Now it's all a trade-off, right? I'm not saying you have to be absolutely sustainable. You know, all of these things are a trade-off. It depends what you want to achieve. Um, so glue is quite an important thing with, with corks, especially tea stops as well. You have to make sure that your supplier is using that glue that's really, really good because you don't want your, you know, your your bit on the on the top here to just break off um, because then you have to get a corkscrew in and I don't know if you've ever tried to remove it remove a synthetic cork with a corkscrew it's really 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 hard to do because they're so dense and they're so plasticky and that again is just as a consumer you want to be able to get into this amazing product that you've bought you don't want to have to mess around with a corkscrew and do this and get the kitchen knife out and slice your hand open because your memory of that product will be how difficult it was to actually get into it to enjoy um so there are a number of trade-offs when you're looking at how to close your bottle the other important thing as well is with a screw cap or something which isn't um sort of pushed in you might need to invest in machinery for that as well so whilst you might think okay i don't want to use a cork there's so many things that can go wrong i just want to use a screw cap that's fine but you have to look into where you're going to have to spend elsewhere um because you need special machinery to apply certain things whereas with a cork it's very easy to do it by hand you can do it by machinery you've got many many options but some things require a bigger sort of spend to begin with to be able to set you up to do that within your infrastructure 
So closures. This is, uh, in my mind, what goes over the cork. So you've got either you've got a screw cap or you've got cork or you've got uh, anything basically which stops the liquid coming in contact with the air. Then the thing that goes over that. Now you can use these for many reasons. Um, what's more important to you? Is it cost, sustainability, minimum order quantities, brand identity, the investment that you need to set it up, or does it need to be tamper evident? So some of the options are really sustainable, some are, and some are really cheap. Others are not sustainable and the costs are very high, but the product may need to be really premium. So maybe it's a stopper where you will keep that bottle and you'll use it as a decanter or something. In that situation, you might want to spend a bit more. Um, and it might not be sustainable, but it doesn't really matter because it's not really going back into that supply chain. Um, others are really cheap to produce and are sustainable, but require that like, require hand finishing, um, which obviously increases labour costs. So you've got a multitude of things which you can choose from. You can uh, use a PVC or a PET heat shrink, um, which is sort of like shrunk on like this. Um, you can use a poly laminate, which is a combination of aluminium and polyethylene. Um, so you see these more on sort of high volume lines. These generally tend to be a roll on um, or potentially a heat shrink, depending on how it's applied. Um, you can use a tin foil, which is essentially um, rolled on. It's a foil, generally it tends to be made up of aluminium, I think. Um, and then you have the option of, you know, paper bandoliers as well. So um, this is quite a nice option where you've got a screw cap and you don't want to use plastic. Um, so that's something we use quite a lot, which is quite a nice tamper evident option, but it may not be something that you want to move into scale when you're doing slightly like larger volumes. But as I said, it needs to be hand applied. So that increases labor costs. Um, you've also got wax as well, which um, there are a number of reasons why you would use wax. It looks beautiful. Um, it has really, really nice finish to it. Um, however, just be mindful of how you get it up how you get it off um and also um where it's going as well you know do you need a pull tab to be able to get that into that product how does that impact your cost how does that impact which closure you use if you choose to use a wax for whatever reason um just make sure that you're thinking about all the other things that go alongside it like you can use wax it can look great but can the customer actually get into it um so, and then the, the last one I'm going to talk about, which is something I don't really have a lot of experience in, but I'm really, really interested to see where it goes, um, is sort of the more sustainable from the off options. So things like cellulose. Um, I haven't tried to use it personally. Um, some of the feedback I've got from people who have used it um, have said it can be quite messy. You need to get it wet first and then apply it and then dry it somehow. Um, I haven't tried to use it personally, as I said, um, but at scale, I can imagine this being quite a tricky thing to implement into the sort of the production of, of your product. Um, but I'm really interested to see how this sort of moves and grows as the years sort of go on, um, because it is something which is talked about. To, uh, I talk about daily um, in terms of sustainability and um, not just making sure your products can be recycled, but actually being really um, clever about where it comes from and just mindful of not just getting something because it's recyclable because where does that energy come from in the first place um so cellulose and plant-based stuff is something um which i think we'll see probably quite a lot of growth in um and i'm really excited to see where that goes so just going back to the subject of wax seals as well um this is something that it's it's taken quite a long time to understand exactly where you need to get to. Um, so it's about using the right wax pot, you know, do your research, make sure that you find the wax pot that's right for you, not only in terms of its operating standards, but also in terms of the volume. You know, if you're only doing a small number of bottles and you don't need a massive amount of wax, don't get a massive wax pot because you need to keep it full all the time. Um, it's, all, it's all about understanding what your product is going to be how you're going to package your product at no volumes and all that sort of thing. And also really, really, really get into the nitty gritty with your supplier. What should the, what should the melting point be to get that level of sort of opacity or sort of density of the wax you want? How shiny should it be? It's really worth um, having a really good relationship with your supplier so you can fully understand what the tolerances are within what you can do, whether it's a, so colored wax might act in a completely different way to black wax, just generally because of the density of the so the pigment in the color so um if you get something like pale pink wax you might need to dip it at a lower temperature 
um, so the wax is slightly thicker, whereas a black, you could probably go slightly higher in terms of temperature because the density of the pigment is more. So um, there's no black and white answer or black and pink answer. It's understanding exactly what you want your product to look like and, and, and how it's being used. And I, the best advice I can give you is really lean on your suppliers um, and, and build that relationship because they want your product the best to be the best it can be. And they're more than likely always willing to help you get there. So next we're going to talk a little bit about filling your bottles and vacuity. Um, so when you fill a bottle, you have some headspace. Um, so this is really important um, as it keeps the whole product intact throughout its journey to the consumer. So headspace is also referred to as vacuity. Um, so as standard, um, the suggestion is that the vacuity should be no less than three and a half percent of the volume of the bottle after cork. Um, so basically if you don't have that you run the risk of that headspace decreasing as the liquid expands when it gets warmer that headspace decreases and then the weakest point of the bottle which is generally the cork will pop now someone said to me well can't you just you know just make sure that the cork doesn't pop you know use a screw cap or something like that and you know what happens when what happens when this isn't the weakest point anymore what happens when this is the weakest point or this is the weakest point? Then the bottle smashes in transit. And I think that has probably got to be so much worse than just your cork popping, right? Because all of a sudden you've got 70 CL liquid or whatever in a box as opposed to the cork popping and some evaporating. It's a lot less mess and a lot less heartache. Um, but I'll be honest, if you're not shipping globally, probably isn't going to be so much of an issue for you right now. Um, if you're not shipping containers, you know, places like Dubai, where it's going to be 45 degrees for four hours, you know, then it's probably not going to be so much of a problem. But it's worth ironing out these issues before you get to that point. If you spent five years building a really strong brand identity and you've got a bottle mold made and everything, and then you find out your vacuity is only one and a half percent and you want to ship it to South Africa and you don't want to use a refrigerated container, then you're going to have so many problems down the line and heartache. So it really is worth looking at those things um, before you get to that point, rather than working out that you need a new bottle mould and it's going to take nine months to produce it and you miss an order for South Africa or Australia. Um, so there's 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 a number of things you can do to make your life a lot easier sort of further down the line. Um, this also sort of highlights the importance of filling to the correct level, also obviously in line with all your weights and measures checks. If you overfill, not only are you essentially sort of giving away extra liquid, um, but you run the risk of decreasing the percentage of vacuity um, and the risk of sort of popping bottles. Um, and there's no legal ramifications for overfilling. You can do it as long as you don't make any claims about the overfilling and it's not being done to avoid duty payment, i.e. rebottling after the duty is paid on the lower volume. Um, for me, it's just not great business sense. Why would you give away something for free? Um, there's no legal ramifications, but actually what it can do is it can, it can uh, impact the integrity of your product when it gets to the consumer. No one wants a pop in bottle at the wrong time. So when we talk about um, weights and measures checks as well, it's also worth touching on temperature um, because liquid contracts and expands at different temperatures. In a cooler environment, it's going to be um, lower in the bottle. Say you bottle somewhere like a garage or somewhere that's outdoors, hasn't got or near outdoors and hasn't got very much heating. Um, if you're bottling at 12 degrees in the middle of winter, um, you're going to get volume wise less in it will look like less in the bottle because of the temperature you've bottled at and then when it goes into someone's house 23 26 degrees that liquid will expand quite a lot um and that obviously impacts your filling um and sort of how that sort of fills the bottle um and when so that's why it's really important when you do your weights and measures checks to always do it at um i think 20 degrees is the standard um just to make sure that you're definitely putting the right amount of liquid in your bottle i mean this is all parts of weights and measures anyway for the uk market um but it, it's worth even if even if you are bottling in a cooler environment or a warmer environment in the middle of summer in, in the south of france or something it's worth making sure that all these things are taken into account you can obviously chill or sort of raise the temperature when you're doing the bottling caveat being you know this equipment costs money um but you will need to at some you will need to make sure that your weights and measures checks are complete anyway just from a compliance point of view so we, we will generally have something in place to ensure that whenever you're filling at 
a certain temperature, you know what the tolerance is on that. So I guess the key takeaways here are, it really depends what you want to do with your product. Um, which, which boxes are you trying to tick? Are you, are you trying to make sure that everything's sustainable or do you want something that's really premium or do you want something that's cost effective? Um, you can do all of those things, just make sure it's really fit for purpose. Um, through a combination of sort of testing, really building that rapport with your suppliers and also with your customers as well, like how is your product being used? And really, you've got to really get into the nitty gritty of understanding the complete journey of your product. And after all, you have put your heart and soul into it, right? And we want to take the consumer on that journey um, and we want to give them the superb user experience exactly as you intended it.